yeah, the recording is begin. Um, unfortunately, the multivariate case is more complicated than one-dimensional case, but um, let's um, start from definition. Last time we introduced the probability space omega with sigma algebra f and probability measure p. Now assume that we have n random variables, one dimensional, and we compose the random vector of these variables. And this is called the multivariate random variable. So it's a mapping from the probability uh, space um, from the space of events omega to Rm. And also we can define the um, commutative distribution function for multidimensional case as the probability that um, each coordinate is smaller, less or equal um, x, j. And this function um, has additional properties to the uh, one dimensional case that if any coordinate um, goes to infinity, then we will get just the community function for random variable with less uh, without this coordinate. And the second property is that if any of coordinates, so I used n, but because we can interchange the order of variables, uh, so it's applied to any variable. So if any variable goes to minus infinity, then this function is zero. And if we add two properties from the one dimensional case that it's goes from zero to one, then um, any function with these properties will define a random variable, multivariate variable, random variable. And um, I think in, in the rest of this book, we will deal only with discrete type and continuous type of uh, random of distributions. So in continuous type, um, in continuous case, it's very easy. The, um, Sorry, somebody has to be muted. Um, so, um, if we can represent our um, commutative density function as the integral of the other function, then this uh, function is called probability density function. And if we have the discrete variable, um, let's uh, introduce the uh, simplest, simplest, um, also people call it the generative um, distribution, which is um, sitting in one point A, lowercase. Uh, then we can define probability for this distribution in the following manner. It's the probability of any Borelian subset is one if this point A um, belongs to this 
subset B and it's zero if it doesn't do one. And uh, then the probability of discrete random variable. Um, well, here I used X, but you can think about X as a vector, a multiple dimensional vector. Um, so we have discrete number of points XK and the probability of uh, any Borelian subset B is just the sum over uh, these the points which belong to B. And I want to mention that, uh, that this representation of the distribution um, sitting in one point is better in my opinion than representation with delta function. First of all, because delta function is not a function. <laughs> And um, it's a functional. Okay. And uh, in the continuous case, we can also. Okay, so there is chat. Um, huh, nothing. Yeah, nothing important. Um, but I will keep it open. In a continuous case, uh, we can do the change of variables and um, so there are some assumptions that uh, the change of coordinates should be smooth and one-to-one -one. and then it's invertible and the inverse is also smooth and we can define this Jacobian matrix. And, this is the determinant. And if we um, introduce new random variable eta, which is um, obtained from the random variable xi using this transformation g, then uh, probability density function will be changed accordingly just multiplying by this uh, absolute value of Jacobiana. Now let's uh, go to some examples. Um, the first example is called multinomial distribution. This is the discrete distribution. I think we have C capital cl classes. And um, P is the vector of probabilities. Uh, so all the coordinates sum up to one and a positive, non negative. And our random variable. Um, each coordinate can have only natural numbers, including zero. Um, you can think about this random variable as a C capital side die. So for example, we, fully, we um, run our die once and we will get one, two or three or four or six. And for example, if we will get two, then um, the second coordinate will be set to one um, and others to zero. If we uh, run our die again, um, and we will get two then uh, in, in the, on the second 
place, we will have two because we had uh, the same number in two rollings. So this is the idea of multinomial random variable. And um, so let's, uh, we have N, um, experiments and we have the probability vector p1 p2 and so on pc then um, k is also vector um, k represents the outputs of our um, experiment then we and um Then the probability that now C and K are vectors with um, C capital coordinates, then probability to have the exact vector C is given by this formula. Uh, for example, um, after rolling die, n times we got k1 once k2 twos and so on in case we uh, run our die only once uh, the we will have the distribution with, which is called categorical distribution and it's useful uh, to use the following notation um, so, uh -huh. I believe that the first one I, I did a mistake because um, K one shouldn't be equal to one. <laughs> uh, here should be just K one. But for the uh, categorical. Um, it works. So um, we use yeah, yeah. these brackets, um, which are equal to zero to one if um, eta equals to one, and equals to zero if eta is not one. For example, it's like char characteristic function. Um, so, for example, if we run our die and we got two, then only the second power will be one, and all other powers will be zero. And so the probability to get two will be just P2, which I hope makes sense. The next example. Uh, is the continuous distribution normal or Gaussian distribution? I don't know why, uh, but uh, Murphy wrote in his book that Gaussian is more appropriate name for this distribution. Um, but we always use this capital N to denote the distributions. So initially I wrote Gaussian and normal in parentheses, but then I was thinking that, well, we're using N, so probably to call it normal is more common. <laughs> Anyways, it's just a notation. Um, we have a vector which is called mean vector of um, some numbers and n by n matrix which is symmetric and positive defined then we can um, build such probability density function and distribution with this probability density function is called 
normal multivariate distribution. Uh, this matrix sigma uh, is also called a covariance matrix, and we will go to the covariance on the next slide. And the inverse is also sometimes called precision matrix. So some numerical characteristics for <clears throat> multidimensional random variables. Um, so I wrote the general definition, but as I said, we will use um, the continuous or discrete random variables. So um, usually we will write just integrals with densities. And here is covariance matrix. So covariance matrix is computed just from one vector. And um, it is defined as follows. The centered random variable times its transpose and the expectation of this. And if we divide the covariance by uh, the standard deviations of our random variables, then this value is called correlation. And later we'll see examples from, um, probably we can look at the examples now from the book. Um, the examples of, yes, here, here were the formulas for the change of variables. And one thing that I couldn't understand, uh, the multinomial distribution uh, was introduced in the previous chapter, which was univariate models, but anyways. Um, I think it's more appropriate to, uh, to introduce in the multivariate chapter. So here are some examples of oops, second, covariance. Oh, sorry, of um, correlation. Um, we, you can see some sets and on the top of the sets, you can see the value of correlation. And it's important to see it to note that um, the number, for example, one doesn't mean um, the slope of this line. In this case, and also different numbers, different um, sets can have the same uh, correlations, correlation numbers. Okay. Um, also, we will need the notion of independent random variables. So, um, now assume that the components of our random variables are not only one dimensional, they could be multi dimensional components. And um, These random variables are called as said to be independent if the probability distribution uh, is the product of probabilities. Or in case of continuous random variables, the uh, PDF probability density function is just the product of PDFs. 
And also we will need the conditional distribution. But before defining the conditional distribution, I will just mention the marginal distribution. So if we have n dimensional vector the in and we integrate over Maybe. some variables, then we will get so-called marginal distribution. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, somebody was unmuted. Uh, so conditional distribution, um, again, in case of continuous variables uh, is defined as the fraction of the joint distribution and marginal distribution. And now we will see how it works uh, on real examples. So last time you remember um, we were uh, talking about the flipping coin several times. Now, I would like to discuss the Bayesian model of flipping coin several times. So assume that we don't know the, if our coin is um, biased or not. Let's denote this parameter of biasness by theta, which is from one to, from zero to one. So if it's one half, then we have unbiased coin. And uh, assume we um, flipped our coin n times and we got m heads in n uh, tossings. So the probability of this event, uh, given uh, this prior knowledge about the biasness of our coin is given by um, binomial distribution. So we have M heads and N minus M tails. Um, now let's uh, assume that um, our parameter theta has a better distribution, but symmetrical one. And I will assume that it's centered at uh, one half. Um, so better distribution is defined as follows. It depends on two parameters, alpha and beta. And uh, you can see in the numerator x power of alpha minus one and one minus x to another power. Why we choose this distribution? Because it's very similar to um, our uh, modal distribution. Here we had the parameter power and here we have parameter into some power. And using bias formula, which we introduced last time, um, we can calculate the conditional distribution. So this is an example of conditional distribution. Conditional distribution, you remember, is the joint distribution over marginal distribution. So on the top, this is the joint distribution of P of X comma theta. And on the bottom is the integral of this distribution over theta. Ah, yeah, it's written the, on the next line. But next line is a little bit further. It will, it will uh, the next line will show us 
how to get the information from the new tosin. So without calculating the uh, information from the previous tosin, but I will go to it later. So um, if we multiply p of x given theta and p of theta, if we multiply these two um, PDFs, you see that we will still have the parameter into some power and y minus this parameter into some power. So we will get still better distribution. Later, when we will um, study generalized linear models uh, and introduce the notion of exponential families, um, you will know that uh, such distributions are called joint distributions when the posterior distribution has the same form as the prior distribution. But now let's look at the example. So <clears throat> I wrote a very um, a simple program for this model. And let's see how it works. So I defined, or oh, I should say that how we call this um, distributions in a second. It's important because people use these names all the way around. So, the probability of our parameter is called prior. The probability of our parameter given data is called posterior. The, prob the our model is called likelihood. And the um, denominator is called evidence. So likelihood, prior evidence, and posterior. Um, so I introduced my likelihood. I introduced my prior. I used beta distribution with the same parameters for alpha and beta because in this case, it's like symmetrical around one half. And you will see it later on the plot. Here I calculate the evidence. And here I calculate the posterior. As likelihood times prior divided by evidence. Now let's put some uh, numbers. It's, so in, in, let's assume we tossed the coin nine, nine times and we had heads for four heads. <clears throat> so you see, it's not important. And um, now let's look at the plot. So the beta distribution, our prior is this orange line. As I mentioned, it's centered at uh, one half. And it's a normal probably assumption that our coin is not unbiased. Um, so our likelihood is this green line. And um, it's, um, how to say, it's not calibrated. So it's uh, not the probability density. And our posterior is blue line. 
So you remember we had four heads. So the peak of our posterior is a little bit shifted to zero. But because we had also our prior information, um, which forced um, our knowledge um, to be centered. Um, this peak is not shifted like closer to zero. And what is more important, last time I mentioned that in Bayesian approach, we can predict um, also without any data points. Let's take the number of hands, uh, let's set the number of heads to zero. For example, we tossed the coin nine times, but all nine times we had tails. Does it mean that um, the parameter of theta is zero? Probably not, because probably if we toss 9,000 times, we will get at least one head. <laughs> So let's see what happens with zero um, heads in nine tosses. So likelihood has maximum at zero, but the posterior distribution of our parameter, it's yes, shifted to zero, but um, it's still not zero the maximum is at 0 0.3 and we can use this estimation for our parameter of biasness 0 0.3 instead of zero um, and it's a good um, why it's um, nice to to do the bayesian um, estimation because we have not the point estimator for our parameter, but we have the distribution and we can also calculate the variance. But in case of, in this case, it's called the highest probability density. So it was just an example how we can use conditional probability and uh, marginal probability in practice. Let's, uh, yeah, I wanted also to mention that this um, Bayesian approach allows us to introduce the new information. For example, we flipped our coin nine times. We obtained the estimation of our parameter. But now let's somebody flipped coin again, one time or several times. I denoted this uh, variable by y. It's very easy just to go through these two lines to get the this distribution based on the previous two equations. Um, you see, we don't need to recalculate, to use x data anywhere in this line because we calculated this posterior on the previous step and we use only the new data. Um, well, I can just uh, briefly explain that here is the definition of um, conditional probability, the joint over the probability of xy. Then we use again um, the definition of conditional probability and this joint. Wait a second. Oh no, these events are independent. So we use independence here. So this joint is the product. Then I combine the first one and the last one. 
and like flips them over. And that's it. We've got the final result. Uh, the next example, which is also um, was the first part of it was in the Murphy's book. The medical diagnostics. So it's a completely discrete um, model. He was using the data for COVID, but I think it's just a nice trend in nowadays. So I used the example, I think, from his previous book without um, references to COVID. Assume we have um, a disease and only 0.1% of people in the area have had this disease. So this will be our prior information. And we have also information about our vaccine that it, um, oh, here, yeah, sorry, vaccine, it was in uh, tests, uh, tests. Um, that for the um, person, like without disease, it predicts that it he has disease with five percent accuracy, and for the ill person, it says that it's not he is not ill with three percent. So these rates are also called false positive and false negative. Um, Let's find the probability that the man has really this disease after two tests gave positive results. So let's look at this like in the previous problem. We flipped coins, we obtained our estimations and we flipped them again and we uh, corrected our estimations. So let's man first um, did the first test. So the probability of being sick or being ill, given that the test was positive, is given by this Bayesian formula. Um, so this is prior of um, probability of been sick in this city. So it's 0 0.001. And here is the likelihood, the probability of that uh, the test was correct if the person was sick. This number will be, where is it? One minus 0 0.03. And the denominator is the integral, or in this case, it's just sum with two possible um, outputs when the person is really sick and if not. And the result of this I calculated is this much, just one, around 2%. Now, as uh, the person will think, for example, well, I will make the, another test for to be more secure. So he makes another test and another test is positive. What is the probability that he is really sick? We use that formula from the previous slide. So we use the probability cal calculated after the first test and um, the new likelihood. And the result will be more 
goes up to 3%. Oh, no, sorry, 30%. So this is another cool example how we can use the Bayesian formula and um, to incorporate new data. It's um, important for machine learning tasks. Now, also um, in this chapter mentioned Simpson's paradox. Uh, so some people can think that it um, deals with Simpson football player because um, here will be um, information about race, but uh, no, this Simpson name um, belongs to the UK statistician. So this example I took from McKay's book also, I think, it would be nice to organize a reading of this book because it's a really cool book, Information Theory, Inference and Learning Algorithms. Um, where he introduced um, the notion of evidence of the model and um, I think we will talk about this later in some chapters when we will talk about model selection. So let's look at this example. I think it's from 80s uh, somewhere from Florida. So you can see the uh, race of the defendants of judges and the race of the victim Oh, no, sorry, of defendant. The race of judgment was in, in case of the, that Simpson football player when uh, he was a black and most of the judge were black and even there were all the evidence. That, there were all evidence that he killed his ex-wife with her boyfriend, but um, they um he wasn't present at that first incident anyways um and here are some numbers um how many people were um uh, assist to death penalty and how many not and here are three models, or oh, four models. Uh, for example, the last one that says that the decision will, didn't depend on the race of the victim or the, the murderer, the defendant. Another one says that it was dependent on, on, on the race of the murderer. The other that it was dependent dependent on the race of the victim and the first one that it was dependent on both uh, race of victim and another. Um, and the um, evidence you remember is the denominator in that Bayesian formula. So we use data and our Hypothesis. I calculated only one because it's not the topic, the topic of this chapter. The topic of this chapter is Simpson paradox. I will say later what is that. But just um, to give you an idea of model selection. Uh, so we have applied the uniform prior on. Uh, wait a second. 
Yes, I, I just calculated for the last, the simplest one, the uniform prior on the decision. So it's just uniform distribution from zero to one. And our model will be just binomial model. So you can see here the number of uh, uh, people uh, with death penalty and the number of all white victims. So it's just, and so on. So you can calculate. And if we calculate this evidence for all four models, then we will get these numbers and more evidence model will be the second one that it, the decision dependent or is dependent on the race of people. But let's go back to the Simpson paradox. If we'll look at these numbers, the number of people, of white people with death penalty, so 19 plus 11, is much, oh no, sorry, 90, is the percent, percent so 19 plus zero. The percentage of um, uh, people, of white people with death penalty is higher than percentage of black people overall. But if we will look just line by line, we will see that in each case, um, 11 of 52 or is Wait a second. It should be the in inverse um, trend. Um, yes, if we um, look at black victims, then it will be six over 100 and something. And if we look at white victims, it will be like 30, yes, over 100 and like 80. And if you calculate this, um, compare these numbers, then you will see that black people uh, were had the death penalty more often than white uh, people uh, in in case of wait a second I'm a little bit lost um, and I don't want um, to give like wrong numbers but the idea is that overall the situation looks like uh, there are more death penalties for white people but in each line it's inverse but uh, you can look at the mccay's book for um even though it's exercise but he provided some um insights in this table but in murphy's book uh it's more uh, understandable so here is the um, plot of deaths after COVID um, in this range of age, orange in Italy and blue in China. 
you can see that um, in each age group in Italy, we have less smaller percentage of um, death cases. But overall, in Italy, uh, the percentage of deaths after COVID, the percentage of this is higher than in China. So this is another example of Simpson paradox. It's uh, happened when our groups are um, not, um, I forgot this name, uh, this word, not balanced. So for example, in China, there are much smaller, there is much smaller number of old people than in Italy. And that's why even though the percentage in this group is smaller, overall percentage of deaths of deaths is higher. And the same was in this table. Uh, we had more information about white victims and that um, gave us this disproportion. Okay. Uh, I have time and we can just look at this um, Marquez book. Wait a second, I will open it and um, just I don't want to leave the open question. <clears throat> I should write that down, but you know, uh, when you present a lot of things, you can forget something. Um, okay, well, let's see. So he says, it seems that the death penalty was applied much more often when the victim was white than when the victim was black. When the victim was white, 14% defendants got to death penalty. Yes. and. Uh, when the victim was black, 6%. Yes, went to death penalty. But in case, wait a second. So we have high fraction of white defendants are sentenced to death overall. Yes, we have more white people since the death penalty overall. But in case involving black victims, so the uh, bottom line, a higher fraction of black defendants are sentenced to death. And in case of white victims, 
again, the high fraction of black defendants are sentenced are sentenced to death. Okay. So let's go to the last um, two slides. Conditional Gaussian is an important thing. So if we have the Gaussian vector with x1 and x2 components, it has this covariance matrix. And uh, the conditional of the Gaussian will be again Gaussian with these parameters for mean and covariance. Of course, I will not uh, derive these formulas now. And um, there is example in the fraud chapter, how can we use this uh, conditional Gaussian for uh, inference of scalar Gaussian random variable. Um, so I think we have our model y given z. Z is the latent variable. And we have this model. It's Gaussian with precision lambda and the mean z. And we have prior distribution on z, again, normal with some mean and precision. And we have our data, our data, why are the results of experiments? So like n experiments, we will compose a vector from these experiments. And in this case, we will have multi, um, dimensional Gaussian uh, with each with Z mean and um, precision lambda. So it will be diagonal matrix. Then we can calculate the um, posterior, which is called inference on this latent variable Z. It will be again Gaussian with some parameters, mu and sigma. And uh, here on the top, oh yeah, here is the model that our y is um, a matrix multiplied by z, but in our case, matrix w was just one. And we didn't have bias plus epsilon, where epsilon has Gaussian distribution. Okay, it's time to wrap up. So uh, we could calculate the parameters of this um, conditional distribution. And it makes sense that precision is larger with the number n because the variance is one over precision. And thank you for attention. Um, let's stop with this presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much, Anton. Um, do people have any questions or comments uh, since we have Anton here? And feel free to uh, unmute your microphones now. Um, oh, I, I see there are some questions in the chat, but I didn't see them. Okay, do you want to go ahead and and address could those? You please, could you please explain the idea behind p of x given theta? Well, um, sure. Uh, imagine the so I think this question was about the flipping coins. Uh, um, so the, probab the probability we, um, we said that 
probably that our coin is biased with parameter theta. So when you flip um, and you have um, head, then you have head with probability of theta according to our model. Yeah. And you have one probability of tail one minus theta. So uh, when we calculate the probability of the result of our experiment x capital given theta, then uh, you know that you had head, then you will write theta. If you know that you had tail, you will write one minus theta. So this is the idea behind P of X given theta. Um, so, Yes, we like have the assumption, we have our model with parameter theta, which is parameter of biasness. And after experiment, we use this our assumption. Uh -huh. Okay. Still understand formula looks like this. Which is formula? Okay. Well. Yeah, I think this all, these are all questions from the chat. And I, are there other questions? If not, I just wanted um, to apologize that my presentation was a little bit messy because when I was preparing, there were a lot of material to cover. And also I spent some time to understand why in first chapter we had like multi-dimensional um, models and covariances, which is which should be in the next chapter. But anyways, I hope um, um, it was a little bit helpful. Yes, and I think it's very helpful. Um, and it might actually be nice to um write down some of those comments and um, we can send them to the author. Um, uh, he would love to get feedback, you know, from, we're pretty much like a, a test group reading his book for the first time. Um, when, so would you like that, that I, for example, write my comments and each person which presented each, uh, its chapter writes its... Uh, yes, I think that'd be good. And then at the end of... And then we will send all... All at the end of the, of the reading group, yes. Okay, I will do that. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Um, so are there any other questions or, or comments? Uh, we will to discuss uh, mixtures the models or probabilistic graphical model in this chapter. Well, um, he introduced uh, uh, just a little bit graphical models and um, and uh, mixture models, but there will be a separate chapter on the on the mixture model. So I didn't cover this. What about the graphical models? I believe there, also, there is also another chapter, but I used graphical models from that example with murderers and victims. So just also to give an idea, a little bit idea of the dependence of variables using the graphical um, representation, but there will be a chapter on graphical, at least it was in the previous edition. I think there should be okay. A ah, okay. Make sure the model in, in this present uh, in this edition. Yeah. The old edition, the there is a mixture of the model. In this edition, there is a chapter uh, on mixture of the model. Oh, I believe uh, there are mixed models. The, the second later. edition of this book uh, doesn't have uh, any chapter about mixture of the model. Let's see. The, uh, 
How well there are generalized linear models of the variables. But I remember that the, the rule that I looked. Uh, I think he makes a comment in chapter three that he will talk about this again in chapter six. Yes, I remember there was the chapter devoted to the, the mixture of Gaussians, so I didn't cover that. Yeah. Because it's like the whole separate session. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's actually packed a lot of uh, information into uh, okay, each okay. chapter. Yeah, he was actually surprised that we were covering one chapter a week. <laughs> he thought that was a pretty a pretty fast pace. So. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Well, that 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 makes me feel better. <laughs> that uh, that uh, that uh, Dr. Murphy thinks so. <laughs> oh yeah, no, he was impressed. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there's a lot of material, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but I think it's good that we're taking this pace because it, you know, I think stretching it out more than 23 weeks is just too uh, it's just too hard on people's um, schedules and commitments. Okay, well, if that's all, um, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Thank you very much, Anton, for presenting. And we'll meet back here next week to, to talk about, um, I guess, uh, statistics is the next um, chapter. And that will actually be presented by Amira, who's a um, professor at a university in, in Delhi, I think. Um, okay. All right, so uh, thanks again, everybody. And uh, Thank you. Have, a good, have a good night. Take care. Bye.